So that's 72 years? Is that how long that's been? Yeah. I know. Fighting for us. Right. Yeah, but how many years is it? 77. Is it 77? Okay, I, I can't remember how many. Wow. So, you, you know, we lost 3,000 guys on that morning. You know, getting mowed down. Can you imagine? It's a shame. But you know, my dad was alive at that time. My dad was 17 years old. I don't know if you guys probably didn't know this, but he actually fought for the Germans. My dad. You know, the Hungarians were conscripted into their army, but my dad never fought the Americans. He fought the Russians. And then I found out I was in Poland wherever, you know, the trench was at the time. And if it wasn't for a toothache, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, that's what saved his life. He was in a trench, you know, fighting the Russians. Actually, it, it saved him twice. Uh, did I ever tell you a story? No. Okay. So uh, the first time, you know, like in, in a wartime, I mean, you stand watch, okay? And you better stay awake for that whole time. And so, you know, he had a German SS officer. That was his command, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, his tooth just bothered him really bad, and, uh, and he was, you know, out all night, you know, trying to stay awake. But that tooth kept him awake, but towards the end, he almost fell asleep. And this officer kind of hit him in the nose, and he goes, you're lucky you didn't, you know, your watch was up there, we would have killed you. Because, uh, you know, you got shot if you uh, fell asleep on watch. Mm -hmm. So it saved him one time, and then a day or two later, it was so excruciating, they sent him out of the, well, wherever they were, the trench, whatever, to go get this tooth yanked. Well, when he comes back, a day later or whatever, the three people who were in his place were all dead. So, you know, and that kind of story you can repeat many times, you know. A lot of people, you know, survived the war. A lot of them didn't, you know. But then you think, you know, the ultimate sacrifice was the Lord Jesus and what he did for us, you know. You know, you think of D-Day, but you think the ultimate sacrifice was Christ himself and what he did. Like I said last week, you know, God died for himself, to, to pay that sacrifice. And that's literally what happened. And I was thinking this morning, I thought, you know, we all gather together every week to read a book that was written 2,000 years ago. I mean, the words on this page written by Paul which is 2,000 years old. We hardly read documents that are 200 years old. But yet this book is as applicable today, if not more so, than it was back then. And, you know, I, I, you know we've had a, I've had a rough week. You know, it seems like every week's hard. Um, but, um, you know, we're not the only ones. You know, we were, my wife and I were driving home from Akron General Thursday, and I see a new SUMA building showing up, you know, and, right off of Route 8, and I go, and I said, you know, the only reason these buildings are being built is because they're sick people. We're not the only ones. I said, if they were, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I, I had, I mean, they wouldn't learn anything off of me because I'm never sick, you know. Um, but it's going to happen one day. We're all going to get sick sooner or later. Um, but... I mean, like the, the dentists don't learn anything off of me because I've never had a cavity, you know. So, except for a tooth that I broke on my own, that's the only reason I ever got a crown. But, you know, everybody, um, you know, there's always somebody worse, you know. And so I, I can't think of ourself all the time. You've got to think of others because a lot of people are going through stuff, you know. But I do want to mention, it kind of works with this, what we're talking about. You guys know who Tim Tebow is, right? He's had a ton of derision 
a lot of people will hate this guy. You know, he is my oldest son's age. They're the same age, 33. And it's because of his profound faith and outspokenness. You know, other people call it a circus, you know, that every time he, you know, it, and it's, it, the man is real, you know. He's not faking it. He's not looking for publicity. And I've heard they talk about this whole thing, and, and I don't even know who this guy, I mean, I know who he is. He's on ESPN. His name is Skip Bayless, and he's one of these guys who talked with this other guy. And uh, he was defending him. And, so, and it turns out that this Skip Bayless, I didn't know what he was, but I, he sounds like a believer himself because he was defending mm -hmm. Tim Tebow. Well, it's freedom of speech. Yeah. I mean, we, we should have that right. But the thing that really stuck to me is if, and then this Skip Bayless said, I, and I thought, you're right, you know. He said, what Tim Tebow is, he's an evangelical, obviously, and, and bold and all these things that he says he's fearless, right? But you know what? When you read the New Testament, what Tim that was like is like, that's what these guys were like. They're bold. You know, there was a guy who was uh, having a problem on an airplane, and Tim, you know, saw it, and he went to the seat, and somebody was filming off a camera. I mean, he wasn't looking for publicity, and he was praying with his family. And apparently, they got off the plane, they got him off, went to the hospital. He went with them. This man ended up dying in the hospital, but he was there comforting the family. I mean, who does stuff like that? But he, he's bold for Christ. He's unashamed, which is the way we should be. We stopped at Chubb and Mary Lou's house last night driving around, and, and Mary Lou made a statement says, you know what, anymore, I don't care. I tell everybody about Christ. You know, I'm, I'm not embarrassed because we see the climate we're in. We're seeing where the world is going, and what do you got to lose, you know? I'm beyond being embarrassed. I've never been embarrassed. You know? So out, you know, if you have the opportunity, you say the right things, but you got to say it in love. You can't say it in, in arrogance. You have to be humble, because Jesus was humble, you know? I guess these guys, when they're talking about Tim Tebow, what they don't like is how he does. He's too bold. He's too... But yet that is normal. You know, they, they want to... They, they'd rather see a very, you know, don't say much and all that stuff, you know. Well, Tim, you know, Tebow, he, what started with him is he was kneeling, I think, before a game or after a play or whatever it was. But here he was kneeling for one reason, and yet Colin Kaepernick is kneeling for a whole different reason. But yet they give him honor and Tim Tebow no. You know, so it's so glaring. You know. Because he's a Muslim versus the religion. And so, yeah. you know, so you know what? Expect it because Jesus said, expect persecution because, you know, they hated me. They're going to hate you too. So expect it. You know, it's, it's, it's par for the course. The devil knows what these people guys that are in the sports world, I don't care what the world it is of sports, what they can do and the platform that they can use to promote Christ. Oh, yeah. And and to help other and to mentor young men that are lost. And they know that. Yep. They have a huge responsibility and the devil doesn't like it. So, so, so we need to pray for somebody like Tim Tebow because yeah. you know he's he's got a good platform and he's consistent. You know, it'd be different if he was had this really strange, you know, habits or vices and you know hypocrisy. You know, that's what Christians are always um, accused of is being hypocrites. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep that, you know, away, you know, be correct in what we're talking about here in Romans six and seven, the world's going to see a difference. The strange thing is that none of the gospel. And, and being a Christian is like two things at one time. It attracts, because Jesus attracted people, but it also repels people at the same time. It's a funny thing, being a believer. It does both. It attracts people, but it also repels them. It's like, you can't have it both ways here, but, but that's how believers are. 
uh, people are attracted to them, but yet at the same time they're repelled by the, the gospel message. So we were uh, in Romans 6 last week and talking about, um, I'll start in verse 15, where uh, Paul, you know, there's this new concept thing here called grace, where by faith we accept Christ and uh, we repent, we accept Christ and and we are now living in this thing called grace. And the Jews at the time, you know, they looked at it as, well, if we're free, then we can just live any way we want to, and God is going to give us all this grace. And Paul addresses this here. And he says, What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart. And that's what we talked about the last couple weeks is our want to is now correct because we want to please God we're not coming from well shoot we got this license I'm going to live the way I want to it's not that way I want to please God now it's a whole different mindset whereas before Christ not only were you not interested you weren't capable because when you are uh, a slave of sin that is the master that's over you it's not God's way, it's your way, it's pride. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So every one of us here were either slaves of sin or slaves of righteousness. There's nothing in the middle here. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So from where we were, what we, how we lived before, we're doing the exact opposite. And we want to do the exact opposite because God has put us in us a new heart. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. And then he indicates the wage of sin. You know, the the godless people out there think the wage of sin is, this is great, and we get to live the way we want, we can just do, live however we want. We can sin all we want, we can have the wrong attitudes, all that stuff, but Paul here says, well, fine, but the wages of sin is death. That is the wage of sin. And that's not a good good paycheck. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, there's nothing here mentioned of what I have to do as a person to earn this. It's a free gift. So, I mean, how many people do you know give you a gift and then later on want it back? <laughs> Nobody does. And that, to me, should tell us about the assurance of salvation. You know, surely God, who gives us this grace freely, puts in us his spirit, is not going to just take it back. Because we can't give it back. Once he owns you, he owns you. Okay? Have you ever heard of a, you know, a master owning a slave back in the day? They don't give up that slave. He, that slave is his until he sells them or disposes them some other way. They just don't let them go. 
So